I was starting to recognize a much different picture of the message religion which I was raised to believe. Things were not as they had seemed. The original Branham Tabernacle was Pentecostal, not Baptist. The deed was titled Billy Branham Pentecostal Tabernacle and did not change its name until 1945. Elders, teachers, and congregation had been part of Roy E. Davis's Pentecostal Church and had transitioned to attending the Billy Branham Pentecostal Tabernacle after a series of criminal investigations that forced Roy Davis and his brother Dan Davis from town. During the time that William Branham was an elder and an evangelist in Roy Davis's Pentecostal Church, and likely in Dan Davis's church and mission in Louisville, Kentucky, Roy Davis was extradited multiple times on charges ranging from sex with a minor to swindling and grand theft. I'd learned that Davis had an extensive criminal history before, during, and after William Branham had worked directly with him. Yet William Branham continued to work indirectly with him and spoke very highly of him in public. I'd learned that since the early 1920s, Roy Davis was an official spokesperson for the Ku Klux Klan. I'd learned that he was working very closely with Congressman William D. Upshaw, and that Upshaw was also a ranking member of the Klan. I'd learned that Upshaw was very physically mobile before entering Branham's healing campaigns, posing in a wheelchair, and that William Upshaw and Roy Davis had once again joined forces in the mid-1940s, provided they were ever separated. They joined together in an attempt to Americanize, or indoctrinate, youth with the Ku Klux Klan ideology. I'd learned that part of that plan included establishing a children's orphanage just east of Los Angeles, shortly before William Branham connected with the Los Angeles elite. I'd learned that the minister from LA working with Branham was Clem Davies, who openly promoted the Ku Klux Klan in Canada and in the United States. I'd learned that Clem Davies was working with Gordon Lindsay, the Prophet's campaign manager. But when I learned that another orphanage was a fundamental part of William Branham's historical timeline, I wanted to know more about this orphanage and its history. In late summer of 1943, another orphanage scheme was announced in the Saskatoon News by men appearing to be unconnected to William Upshaw, Roy Davis, or Clem Davies. A four-square minister by the name of Herrick Holt was asking for a quarter of a million dollars to erect an orphanage. The four-square church belonged to another Pentecostal sect whose central figure was Amy Simple McPherson. Branham spoke highly of her in his sermons. McPherson's headquarters was located in Los Angeles, which was geographically a tie to both Roy Davis and Clem Davies. Herrick Holt would have been in communication with McPherson and or her group. McPherson herself was nearing the end of her life, suffering from numerous health problems which created the perfect opportunity for another central figure to enter the scene. Like Davis and Upshaw's orphanage, Herrick Holt's orphanage plans included a school. Holt had not yet secured the money but stressed that it was a faith project and he claimed that he would get the funding regardless of whether or not it seemed impossible. Architectural plans required a large tract of land, large enough to supply housing, training, and work for 100 boys and girls. I found it very interesting that the plans were announced shortly after Roy Davis and William Upshaw announced their orphanage. The Sharon Orphanage was announced in October of 1943, and the Davis Upshaw Orphanage in August of 1943. Both orphanages were faith-funded, and both had plans to include a school that was isolated from the public school system. By May of 1944, the project had doubled in expense to half a million dollars. In today's money, that is $7.2 million. In September of the same year, Herrick Holt announced his plans to purchase the Mounted Police Barracks, along with 2,000 acres for the orphanage and connected facilities. By May of 1946, the Sharon Orphanage and Schools 
were quickly growing and exercising custody of 28 children. Herrick Holt assured town leaders that the school was undenominational but Protestant. In the same way, I wondered about Roy Davis and William Upshaw creating a Department of Americanism for their orphanage. I was curious why an orphanage would need to advertise that it was connected or disconnected from denominations at all. What did the orphanage have to do with religion? I also wondered why and how this undenominational orphanage in school became connected to William Branham. In the summer of 1947, William Branham's campaign toured through Canada and his new angelic commission story was introduced when W.E. Kidson managed the campaign team. The Branham campaigns held meetings in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, which was the home of the Elim Tabernacle. Saskatoon was a strategic location for multiple regions. Geographically speaking, it sat on the Trans-Canada Highway. From a religious standpoint, it was a religious center for Pentecostal meetings. The Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada often held meetings at the Elim Tabernacle, and it was home of the Bethel Bible College, founded by George Houghton. At the time of the Branham meetings, Houghton had just resigned under pressure from the school he founded, adding to the perfect storm. George Houghton was sympathetic to the ideologies of white supremacy, which would eventually lead to his disgrace. Over the years, Houghton would make a name for himself due to his unusual religious doctrine as well as his work in promoting the supreme white race. According to Houghton, blacks were created to serve the superior race of whites. Religious historians describe the events that took place after Branham's meetings in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. George Houghton joined forces with Herrick Holt and began working with the Sharon Orphanage. Percy G. Hunt resigned from the Bethel Bible School to join Houghton at the orphanage. Branham's campaign tour continued through Saskatchewan to Calgary and finally to Vancouver. George Houghton, Herrick Hunt, and several students from the orphanage followed William Branham to Vancouver for the meetings. As the reporters, who were fully aware of the questionable tactics being reported in the meetings throughout the United States, covered the unusual events from the meetings with skepticism, the men from the Sharon Orphanage claimed to witness several healings and supernatural events. Suddenly, the Branham campaign had witnesses. I wondered, why were Houghton, Hunt, and 70 students from an orphanage following William Branham? Did they really witness genuine healings? I found an article written by Alfred H. Pohl, one of the men from the Bethel Bible School who attended Branham's meetings. Pohl described what he witnessed in Branham's meetings in the Bible School and described his own private visits to the dorm. After Branham left town, many of the healed started dying. Pohl, who was a strong supporter and promoter of the meetings, was left to answer the very difficult questions, both from reporters and from the family members who had lost loved ones that were supposed to have been healed. Meanwhile, reporters were growing extremely curious as to the finance and intentions of the orphanage and school. The Sharon Group continued to purchase land, aircraft, buses, and other resources. Mysteriously, these purchases were funded by donors from the United States. How was it done, reporters asked of Holt. What did he use for money? They now had cottage homes, a trade school, a hospital, even a vacant airport building. The same month of Branham's Vancouver meeting, the leaders of the Sharon Orphanage formed an interdenominational Bible college. The orphanage began publishing a newsletter promoting a combination of the doctrines of William Branham and Franklin Hall. Hall had published a book on spiritual fasting and toured the continent holding revivals. What are you going to start it with? I'm going to start some it with money. Huh? Some money. All right, good. I'll help you start. It. All right, so that's fine. Shortly before William Branham teamed up with Little David, Hall teamed up with Jack Walker, Little David's father, to establish a daily fasting center in San Diego. Like Branham, Hall held conventions with the 12-year-old preacher, addressing crowded auditoriums. The more connections I found, the more questions I had. This was no ordinary orphanage. 
Why was a Canadian orphanage promoting American ministers in their newsletter? Was this an attempt to counter the media's attempt to expose the unethical tactics and backgrounds of the men involved with the Branham campaigns? The meetings that Branham held in Vancouver were organized by Ern Baxter, who toured with Branham from 1947 to 1953. Shortly after the meeting, in 1948, Baxter's secretary, George H. Warnock, started attending revivals at the Sharon Orphanage. The revivals gave birth to a movement known as the New Order of the Latter Rain. The movement based its theology loosely on a passage from the Old Testament in the Christian Bible. The quickly growing sect repurposed a prophecy from the book of Joel in the Old Testament that stated, He will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. It was a passage that we heard often in the early years of the message. William Branham frequently taught about the locust, the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm from that passage. Entire sermons Branham preached were based upon Joel's prophecy. Towards the end of his ministry, William Branham started claiming that Joel's prediction was being fulfilled and that the Son of God was going to be made manifest. God was appearing in the form of a prophet. Not a man, God, but it'll come through a prophet. Ern Baxter's personal secretary, George Warnock, began promoting William Branham's more extreme doctrines under the name Joel's Army or Manifest Sons of God. This movement was supposed to demonstrate God revealing himself in the form of a prophet. I was surprised when I noticed the names of the people who were involved. Key figures in the message cult following helped spread parts of the latter rain theology. But I was more surprised to learn what they created and how many people died because of their creation. Most of all, I was surprised that sermons with the title Manifested Sons of God were renamed, apparently to conceal all traces of William Branham's connection to Jim Jones.